it takes me back to memory lane of my heritage in Christ. These are some of the powerful hymns that tallies with our focus this morning. Life is becoming more challenging and more tough to live in. And except you know how to pray, one is likely to be drowned in life experiences. Thank you so much, my lovely sister. The Lord bless you mightily. I've known you to be a woman that God has indeed trained and prepared for a time like this. Your ministration this morning confirms it more. That indeed God has a lot to use you for in the body of Christ. Thank you so much. The Lord continue to anoint and oil your life so that you will never go dry. Praise the Lord. Good morning, everyone. I thank you for the opportunity to be back within the family. Praise God for Sister Florence Famuso. Thank God for Sister Lovely Mbayazi. Praise God for my lovely Sister Ife. If I don't mention your name, it is not because you are not important. It is because I've been set to speak for a limited time, but I cherish the company of the saints in the Dunamis house. Thank you so much for your faithfulness. I pray that the Lord will continually strengthen and renew you so that you'll be able to stand in the tough season we are in. I don't want to be an alarmist. I'm not a prophet of doom, but the reality of the season we live in kind of confirm what prophecies have been saying over the time. That maybe, maybe, maybe you have just started a journey that is determining the story of mankind and the world. It appears heaven is closing in on the book of mankind. But this morning, my focus to you is to remind you what you probably already know. And if you don't know it, to let you know that as an individual, as a child of God, as a family of God, there are certain things that you need to do to overcome life storms. So as we quickly go through this, I want to encourage you. I saw that many people are not taking down notes when our sister was ministering. I don't know, maybe you have access to the recording, but I would admonish you to do that because whatever you write down cannot be changed and they will come handy as you go through life experiences. Father, once again, we thank you for this opportunity to share within the family some of the nugget of life that you've given us. So that Lord God in going through life will come out victorious. We'll always be on top because you've given us instruction that we will follow this morning so that our lives will be more strengthened to face the accuser of the brethren and experience the victory that you've promised us. Thank you, Father Lord. In Jesus' name I've prayed. Amen. Amen. Uh, I want you to be aware of the fact that I have a limited time. I've been given a limited time. And uh, I know that within this short time, we'll be able to bless one another. I may uh, mention some passages of the word of God. All I want you to do is that you write them down and then go and check them up later because the time may not uh, 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 allow us to really read them. But for as many as we, as we read, I pray that the Lord God himself will minister to us. As a child of the living God, none of us is guaranteed escape from life storm. Life tough situation. I know that some of you will agree with me when uh, they were confronted with the word of life, with the word of God. Some people might have prepared their minds saying that once you come to Christ, 
everything goes on smooth. Well, what they meant is that you'll be equipped to face life easy. But not everything will go on smooth. You will experience challenges. The word of God says that that, that man who will live a righteous life must be ready for trouble. The word of God assures us that every man born of a woman is born unto trouble. I know that one of the things that you might say is that, oh, well, every man is born into trouble because Mr. and Mrs. Adam signed that document of trouble for us. But I'm now a child of God. Yes, that is true. You are a child of God. You have the opportunity to triumph over life circumstances. But not that you are born again not to experience tough life situation. No, you go through tough life situation. But you will always triumph. The word of God makes us to understand that for a child of God, many, not a few, many are likely, no, many are the afflictions of the righteous. I believe that is in Psalm 34, verse 19. The Amplified Bible says, many evil confront the constantly righteous man, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Many, not a few. Not, the, well, I went through this, I'm not going through it again. No, you don't have a choice. More so because you are a righteous person. This is not the doing of God. It is not that God delight in his children facing challenges or problems. No. In fact, the Bible says that God delights in the well-being of victorious life, or overcoming life of his children. But it is just because, number one, you and I were brought into a life that is already falling. The devil is at rampage. You know, the Bible tells us that we have an adversary and an enemy that wants to undo us. But God did not leave us alone. In that passage, it says the Lord will deliver them. If the word of God just says the Lord will deliver them from their troubles, that will be fine. But you realize what the word of God says there, the Lord will deliver them out. It's not just that he will deliver them alone and leave them in that situation, but the Lord will deliver them out of those troubles. God is the wonderful, mighty deliverer. Nothing can stop him from delivering his people. Nothing is so powerful to keep them in a bad situation. But the condition is that they too must know their right and exercise some things. I don't have the time, like I keep on saying, to list everything, but I will mention some. So that you may know that it is required of you, number one, to know your inheritance. In this area, to know your inheritance of being delivered. I'm not talking about being delivered from the causes and other things that we think about that, oh, let me go for deliverance. No, I'm talking about what you need to do when you confront life challenges, when you confront the storm of life as an individual, as a family, as a father, as a male, as a mother, as a wife, even as children. We have responsibility to do some things so that we can overcome the adversary of our life. I want us to remember that there is a true genuine love of God that he has promised all his loved ones without exception. Once you are a child of God, once you've confessed Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, there is a genuine desirous mindset of God to deliver you. He has promised that. I want you to also tell yourself, a passage you and I know tells us that God is not like that day. No, far, 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 far from it. Neither is God like any one of us seated here. The reason he is not like us is that, number one, he has all the ability 
in heaven and on earth to do whatever he wants to do. Number two, he loves you so much that your well-being is a major concern in him. Number three, God owes no man nothing. He's not seeking your political vote. He does, he's not, he's not conscious of, oh, let Bade, what Bade will say. He doesn't concern him. And that is why the Bible says God is not man that he should lie. One of the things that makes us to lie is that we are not capable of being in control of our life issues. And now we want to play favoritism to people. So we want to tell them what we know that they want to hear, but what is not effective. So we lie. Even when we meant the best, sometimes we promise we'll do something and at the time that that promise need to come to bear, we are short of ability to carry them out. But we've already lied. Well, God is not like that. God is not man that he should lie. Whatever God says, that is what he will do. He will never, never back off from his promises. So you and I have to remember that, that God loves me. Let me tell you that one of the things that I found working in the life of a Christian, one, is the revelation of the love of God. You must have that revelation deep down in your heart that God loves me. Whether people say I'm ugly, it doesn't matter to me. God loves me. Whether I have all that the people have around me or I don't, God loves me. Whether life is rosy dandy and everything is going smoothly or not, I believe that God loves me. Not on the basis of what I've done. Not on the basis of how I've been faithful. Not on the basis of my pedigree. Not on the basis of my lineage. In spite of all the yardstick and parameters that the world uses to judge, which I qualify for none, God loves me. You have to tell yourself that over and over and over again until it becomes a mantra, a sing song in your heart. What is it? That God loves me. The devil doesn't want to hear that. And if he doesn't want to hear that, he will repeat it into his ears over and over again, such that he will block his ears and yet he'll be hearing it and then he will flee. God loves you. The revelation of that must be deep down in our hearts. It must be such that it is seated there to confront issues of life. That consciousness of God's undying love we give you the weapon to use for victory. We must always learn to draw our strength from a conviction of God's love for us. The Bible says, I believe in John, 1 John. 1 John, not the, uh, not the Gospel of John. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. You can read it. We have a song for it, but it just says in one way that what manner of love is behold, look, look at this kind of love that God loves us. When you understand that, I guarantee you, based on the word of God, victory is already assured. Because with that, you can confront your situation and your circumstances. Look, look at the kind, look at the manner of God's love for me. It builds hope, it builds strength in the face of persecution, in the face of being treated badly. And I can guarantee you, if you are a student of 
the history of the world so far, you discovered we Christians may be in for a real tough time. But once you know this, you can be sure that they have victory. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet communion or fellowship of the Holy Spirit. When you know this, you know that the grace of God is with you. The love of Jesus Christ is with you. And the assembled or the congregation or the fellowship of the Holy Spirit is with you. Mention that when you are in a situation and see what happens. The devil doesn't want to hear it because you know what that does is a sword. The word of God is a two-edged sword, right? As you say it, it kind of nibbed the devil, nibbed the devil spiritually. And what will he do? He will flee from you. Hear what God says in Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 3. Again, please write it down. We don't have the time. I was only given 40 minutes. It says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. The love that is not limited to a period of time. Jeremiah 31 verse 3. I have loved you. This is God talking. You read that passage. I'm just picking that one verse, but read it very well. You will discover, I have loved you with an unending, unlimited, unperishing love. Yeah, not the kind of love that we love with one another that is limited to give me, give you. When you offend me, then I'll criticize. Haven't I showed him love or something when I did this? One? No, this is an unending, expanding, expansive love. I've loved you with an everlasting love. I pray that you have the revelation of that love of God towards you. When you read Romans chapter 8, verse 28, you discover that God was talking about this same love. I want you to learn to see through the eyes of the spirit. You cannot see through just human reasoning. You have to have the eye of the spirit to see the kind of and the depth and the height and the width and the length of that kind of love from God towards you. A love that is, like I said, is not dependent on whatever you did or whatever you did not do. Now, I must explain this briefly. When you have this kind of love, you will also love in return. We used to say that for God loves us because and we love God because he first loved us. Love begat love. When you understand the depth and the length and the width and the breadth of the love of God towards you, you will love him in return. Now, your love is not going to be as perfect as his own love towards you, but you love him in return. So I'm not saying that God loves you anyhow if you continue to sin. You are not going to sin. When I say you are not going to sin, it means you are not going to willingly decide to sin. You know, you may commit some sins as you go on, but if you read uh, the first book of uh, Apostle John, not Gospel of John, he says, if we say we do not sin, we lie, and the truth is not in us. But the truth is this, if we sin, there is a remedy for us. The love that we have from God will quicken or will challenge us and we will quickly repent. If you commit sin and the Holy Spirit is challenging you and you are looking for excuses, then it means that you have to work on your love towards God. You don't love him yet. The love of God in your heart will make you to avoid sin. But if peradventure you fall into sin, 
that love of Christ in you by the power of the Holy Spirit will challenge your heart and you say, Lord, if I confess my sins and turn away from them, God is a just God, a righteous God, who will not only forgive me of my sins, but he will wash away all my iniquity. So what I'm letting, you, uh, letting us understand is our love for God demands that our eye of the Spirit is open. We can see things as God wants us to see. So one of the things you are likely to say with that love is that, Father, you are the king over my storm. You are the God who is powerful enough to take over and not allow the storm of my life to undo me. I would still be a son of God because I love him because he first loved me. I want you to understand that when Satan ways to destroy you, it will separate you. What the devil always do is that he will separate you from people who can encourage you. He will separate you from reading the word of assurance of God. He will separate you from even listening to the music of the assurance of God. The devil will separate you to destroy you. You'll be overwhelmed with life situation. But when you remember that God loves me, then the devil begins to jitter. Remember the word of God says, I will be still and know that you are God. In life situation, one of the things that the word of God te te teaches us is to be still, be calm. You remember what the, the, the disciples said to Jesus Christ, they accused him when they were in a boat and it was a stormy sea. Lord Jesus, care it not that we perish. Don't let that happen to you. Some people, things will happen to them and they will say, why me? Why not you? I'm not saying you enjoy what is happening, but if you understand the scripture very well, you understand that it's not a question of why me? We don't like to go through the experience of Job. And I pray that we don't go through it. But if it were not that we can read, we don't. We know what is happening behind the scene. Job never knew. Job was never knew. Job never knew that God was bragging on him. But see his attitude. He knows. He knows. I know my redeemer liveth. If my redeemer liveth, what does he do? He loves me. So that in going through my situation. That gives me an assurance that God will not let me die in that situation. You remember the story of the young Jewish man? They did not argue with the king. They said, king, do whatever you want to do. We know that's fire burns. But what we want to assure you is that our God is able to deliver us. However, if in his sovereign decision, he desire not to deliver us and let us be consumed by the fire, nevertheless, we will not deny him. I want you to think about that. You and I are reading it and it seems not, not much. No, 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 no. It is true. They were telling us the stories of the life experiences of some young men. They were not old men who are ready to die. They are young men with their future. They are intelligent people. And yet that is facing them in the eye. They are about to be consumed by fire. They are not ignorant. Some of us will say, I know God will deliver me. I know God will deliver me. But we begin to see that ah, this thing doesn't seem so. This thing is toughing, is getting tougher. I know God will deliver me. Then we, we begin to reduce our statement. I know God can deliver me. Maybe he will not deliver me. Ah. And very soon we begin to compromise. Very soon we begin to compromise. And then we say, oh, well, but I'm just an ordinary man. No, you are not an ordinary man. You and I are supernatural men. Why? Because the Holy Spirit, the strengthener, the enabler, who is inside of us. The one that can remind us of who we are in Christ Jesus. And as a young Christian, I think 
I don't know how many of us know a, a song we used to sing in the past. Uh, it was very popular at the time. They say, he who began a good work in you. He who began a good work in me. He said, he's able to complete it. He's able to complete it. He who started a good work, he's able to complete it in us. God that saved you is able to save you through. He does not have an abandoned job. He saved me and you for a purpose. If in his sovereign wisdom, he allows us to go through the storm of life, be reassured he knows about it. It has not caught him unaware. It gives him pleasure that you triumph and enter into victory. It does not give God pleasure that you fail or that you be perished. Says God is interested in your well-being. That is the word of God. So if he has started a good work in you, he's able to complete it. Be assured yourself that. The second thing I want us to know quickly is that you have to understand the power of the word of God. The power of the word of God in the administration of God's love in your life. There's a power in the word of God. I know that you can quote to me and say, yes, God honors his word high above his name. That is true. Already his name is exalted. But if you know the word of God, you are already on the path to victory. Guaranteed by that word. A child of God must be richly Endowed with the word of God. It does not jump at you. You have to do it. Paul was telling his disciples, study to make yourself approved unto God. You have to do it. Get the word of God soaking you. My own method is that I want the word, my understanding of the word to dwell in me. I may not quote the, the, the exact uh, uh, passage or say, I quote the word, but I may not quote the passage and say, John 3, 16. I know what it means. Why did I, why do I do that? Because I understand that the Bible was not written in this pattern that we read it today. The pattern we read it for is to make it easy for us. The word of God is like a prose. There was no chapter there was no verse, but man made it so that it can be easy. If you can do that, that's an added blessing. But more than that, get the word of God in you. That is, understand what that passage is saying. You can, you can understand this, that the word is not written in Bali language. It was translated into Bali language. It was not written in Yoruba language. It was translated into Yoruba language. But the idea behind that is that once you understand it in your own understanding, it becomes a weapon of victory in your life. So if you are not like uh, maybe Pastor Daniel or somebody else who can quote and say in John chapter 3, in April chapter, whatever, understand the word of God. So keep the word of God into your spirit, man. Let the word of God dwell in you richly, such that when the situation comes, whether you quote the passage correctly or not, quote the word correctly. Tell the devil in whatever understanding language you have that this is the word of God. Because some people, you know, they get defeated when they hear what passage of the scripture is it? Oh, what verse? What is it verse two or verse three? When you are doing that, the devil slaps you. But just understand the word. Let it be part of you. Let the word of God be part of you. If you can remember the passage, fine. It's even better. 
But let that word, let, I realize that God loves me. Ah, but I don't know the passage, but I realize that he says, for God so loved the world that he gave his son. Yes, 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 yes. God so loved me that he gave me his son that I will not perish. I am the son of the living God. My name is written in the Lamb Book of Life. Satan, the Lord rebuke you concerning me. The devil doesn't want to hear that. Because that is the sword of God that does the victory. Put this down, please. Romans chapter 15, verse 4. Psalm 119, verse 28. Genesis 21, 2. We need to draw strength from the scripture. We need to draw strength when we face the storm of life. And the only place we can draw strength it is from the word of God, the scripture. A man that claims to be a child of God and doesn't have the word of God richly dwelling in him will be defeated hands down. You and I know that one of the things that gave Jesus Christ victory, number one, when he was being tempted by the devil is his understanding of the word of God. You will never see there that he says in Deuteronomy chapter 8, from where he picked those three passages. He says, it is written. Now, again, let me say the caveat is that it is not wrong for you to quote that passage. Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 8. Deuteronomy verse, chapter 8 verse 28. It is not wrong for you to quote them. But if you don't remember, just remember, it is written. The devil knows what you are saying. He knows where that passage is. But he doesn't want you to have an understanding. And what you are showing me is that I have an understanding that I can draw strength from the word of God. I can draw encouragement from the word of God. Ezekiah chapter 2 verse 2. Please go and read it. I have just a few more minutes to go. My third point is that you and I, when we face the storm of life, we have to encourage ourselves. We have to engage ourselves in strategic prayer. What do I mean by strategic prayer? Let me give you a brief picture of a boxer. Any boxer that will win a fight does not just punch anyhow. A boxer is strategic where his punches lands. And if I ask you, you will, real, you will tell me that the best place that the boxer wants his boxing to land is where? The head. Why? Once you land every blow on the head, the machine of that person's life gets into trouble. If you land the second one there, if you land the third one there, before long, it's KO, technical knockout. Because that is the brain system, that is the machine room system of the life of a person, physically. And in similar manner, Learn to engage in strategic prayer when you are confronted with life issues. Don't beat around the bush. Don't argue with the devil. Don't tell him, devil, you know me, I'm a child of God. Don't hit me, don't block me. No, no, you know, I did, I paid my time. You know, I'm not an adulterer. I don't fornicate. Don't, is, that doesn't concern him. But realize that you need strategic prayers the kind of prayer that knocks the devil off his balance. Let him know not only that you're a child of God, not only that you know his secret, but that you know his doomsday and that his doomsday is around. As he reminds you of your fallen experience, don't argue with him. Remind him of his eternal hell and doom. Psalm 34 verse 4 to 7. Go read it. Psalm 34, verse 4 to 7. Let me try and see what I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from those who. 
Their faces are covered with shame. This poor man called, and the Lord had him. The Lord saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamped around those who fear him, and he delivers them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Psalm 61 is one very good psalm that I like. Psalm 61, verse 1. I'll read that too. Time or no time. It says, Hear me, hear my prayer, O God. Listen to my prayers. From the end of the earth, I call to you. Hear my cry, O Lord God. Listen to my prayers. I call you from the ends of the earth. Prayer is not just asking and receiving. It is also a spiritual tool overcoming life challenges. Prayer is not only God give me, God give me, God give me. It is also a devastating tool against the kingdom of Satan. I thank the Lord, like I said, when our sister was leading us in prayer this morning. And life issue today has made it that Satan does not want us to have a time to pray. Satan bombards us with all issues of life. You went to work, for example, early in the morning and you are coming back late in the night with all the traffic, with everything. Number one, you are exhausted. Number two, is it you are tired? What is the difference between exhaustion and tired? Maybe the same thing at a different level. So you come home, you want to prepare me, you want, before you finish all that, even the person who is going to eat it is also tired. And so what happens? You just feel asleep and you go to bed. The devil is doing everything that you will not be able to have time to communicate. Again, prayer is not one-way traffic. Prayer is mutual between you and God. Prayer is not only talking to God. Prayer is also receiving from God. But I know most of us today, we don't even have time to wait and listen. It says, be still and know that I'm God. We don't have that time, but we ought to. We don't have to pray long, elongated prayers. Go to the point, like I said, strategic prayer. Go to the point, tell God about it, and then take time to listen. Prayer is a weapon of victory that God has given his people. If you don't embark on prayer, you're already listing yourself for life failure. Fourthly, I want to tell us that we need to maintain a lifestyle. A lifestyle of what? An atmosphere of joy to overcome the storm of life. You have to maintain a lifestyle, an atmosphere of joy. The joy of the Lord is my strength. 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 He makes me happy so I can shout, ha, ha, ha. Well, I belong to the older, ancient and modern. For those of us, some of us here, these are foreign choruses. But these are choruses that you can sing even while turning banga on the stove or making a bar. It's a song that doesn't need any technicality. But what do you mean? It is powerful. Because it builds up joy. And the devil is afraid of you being joyful in the face of storm. The devil wants you to behave like the ordinary man in the world. Oh, what is you? What happened? Oh, Jesus, they don't mean it. Oh, God, they don't mean it. They can even say it, you know, when you think they mean it. They don't know it. It is the spirit of God in the heart of man that just prompted them to say that. The reality is that they, 
you are different from them. You exercise the joy of the Lord that can make the devil to be mad. Joy of the Lord is not God, what God puts on you. You have to. I'm not talking about happiness. What depends on the happiness around. I'm talking about the inner jubilation, the inner merriment, the inner celebration of your assurance of God's ability in your life concerning that situation. You have to maintain a lifestyle and an atmosphere of joy. Whether the devil likes it or not, whether he trumps the kettle and this whatever, even the whole oven against you, you still exercise the joy of the Lord. Nehemiah chapter 8 verse 10. That my strength is in the joy of the Lord. God gives you that joy, but Satan is afraid of it. He can't take it away from you except you give it to him willingly. For you and I know that, no, nothing frustrates the devil more than when the devil sees you maintaining your joy in spite of all that he throws against you. Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. Let me say that this scripture does not say rejoice in yourself. No, rejoice in the Lord your God. It's not giving us as an option. We should rejoice, not because everything in our life is working rosy dandy. We should rejoice because that is where we get our strength from. Job chapter 1 verse 20 talks about the fact that Job, even facing all his challenges, have decided, I know that my Redeemer lives. And that which I've committed unto him is able to keep against that day. Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 17. Let me quickly read that because it talks powerfully. Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 15. Habakkuk is one that always hides. But as he's not a minor prophet. Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 17. Where are you? Show yourself up. I found you. Okay. But let me let me read verse 17. Habakkuk wanted to hide, but I found it. Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no graves on the vine, you can translate that to your expectation. Though I've wanted to have children, but children are not here yet. Do I wanted to get married, uh, the spouse is not here yet. Do I wanted to build the house on Potomac River, but the cement is not being delivered yet. Whatever those things might be your expectation. Though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, Yet, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God, my Savior. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to go on the height. Whoever told you that once you come to Christ, everything will be rosy, then they didn't complete this, this statement. What they meant and perhaps did not explain is that, yes, now you get saved, you have the weapon. Not that Jesus Christ does abracadabra magic. No, you will have the weapon of overcoming the enemy. Even such that in situations like this, which Habakkuk is talking about, even though my expectations are not yet met, even though I have prayed, even though I have, nevertheless, God, who is my Savior, will strengthen me in the inner man with the joy of the Lord. That joy is what I want you to remind yourself of and build up and remain strengthened by the power of the Holy Spirit. 
Joy is an inner state of rest and merriment. It says, come unto me, all ye that are labor. There are laborers. Come unto me and rest. My body is light. My yoke is easy. Come and rest in the joy of the Lord, which is an inner thing. It is derived from the fact that God is still alive and is still in charge. Your joy is not derived on the happenings around you. It is derived on the inner understanding that God is still alive and is still in charge. You may not be able to explain it to human beings because they don't have the parameter of understanding what you are going through. All the thing that the world is ready for you to say is, I'm hanging there, it is tough. Oh. You confess all those negative, and you think you are a Christian, you think you are being factor. No, you are telling the devil, you don't understand what you have. You are complaining to God, and we, me and you know that God does not like being a complainant. Worst thing, he doesn't like those who grumble. I know my time is up, by a few minutes now, but let me say something. I came to the understanding of this attitude some years ago when the picture of the Jewish people came into my mind of what they went through and why the word of God says they were destroyed in the, in the wilderness because they were murmuring. What do I mean? They saw what God did for them in the land of Egypt. They have the live memory of how God took them, snatched them, delivered them from Pharaoh, the most powerful ruler of the earth then. They saw how God fed them. And yet, you know what? Once they face a challenge that God believed that he has taught them to believe in, they began to complain. You know what they complain about? Cucumber. I don't know how many times you've eaten cucumber here. For Africans, cucumber is not the kind of food you remember to mention. Or it's not the kind of, and yet they complain about cucumber, about lettuce. That in the land of Egypt, see Mumu people, Mumu people, in the land of Egypt, we remember we have cucumber, we have lettuce. Is that what is significant here? But now they, they are complaining about being tired of manna. Number one, they did not plant it. Number two, they did not harvest it. Number three, they did not wash it. They did not cook it. They did not do anything. It was a free meal that has all the needed ingredients for balanced meal. But maybe because it was monotonous in the morning, afternoon, night, they thought they had the right to complain. You know what I discovered? It's so simple. God, Abba, Abba, what can you not do? You did this for me. You did this for me. You are the one that supplied this. You are the one that delivered me from the, the Pharaoh. You killed even his first son on my behalf. You mentioned all that God has done and said, God, is it just rice that you cannot provide? You can even make it jollof rice. You can even put turkey or chicken on it. You can even put dodo in it. What can you not do? And as you sing God praise it with joy, he will say, yes, you see, that's my daughter. Gabriel, come, Angel Gabriel, come and hear him. He get done there. come and hear my son. See, he knows me. And that one will say, daddy, you better do something so that we will hear more of this song. And God will say, yes. Um, let all the talking in the land of Jordan and everything, head out towards the desert. Let all the angels in the kitchen above who are cooking that manna, let them begin to cook jollof rice. And before you know it, you get what you need from God. But when you complain, you complain, you murmur, you, you are telling God, God, you are not wise enough to know what you ought to do. I can advise you, even me. That's what you're doing. And it annoys God. 
to let the joy of the Lord swell up in our heart. Let the word of God come alive in our lips. Let the dancing of joy and celebration of God's ability rock our feet so that God will be able to do what he wants to do and the devil will not overcome us. Never let anything to take your joy. Make that a commitment with God and you will experience an unusual victory in life. Make it a commitment. Nothing will take my joy. Nothing. Not this man. Not this woman. Not even my children. Not my unemployment. Not my whatever. Nothing. Nothing will take my joy of the Lord. Nothing. I've made up my mind. In spite of what I'm going through or what I will ever go through, they will not take my joy. I know that I'm having pain. Yeah, but you will not take my joy. Yeah, I have this migraine. You will not take my joy. You have to express it. It's a tool of victory. Give God joy. Give him praise. You cannot say you have joy and you will not praise God. Impossible. You can't. Give God praise. I choose to rejoice. I choose to live a life of joy in the Lord. And I will rejoice. Fifthly, as I round up, I want us all to obtain grace from, from prophetic utterance. I know that today, you know, we have all kinds of so-called prophets. But wherever there is genuine prophetic utterance of the word of God, I want you to make yourself avail of that. Why? Any prophecy that is coming from God has the word of God backing it up. Not the imagination of man. Not the concussion of tradition. And what, does that, what that does is that the word of God comes to believe the word of God. Believe his prophet. I can't I don't have the time. I can't remember where that passage was said. So what I'm trying to say as we round up is that there is value, great value in the prophetic utterance of the word of God into the life of the children of God. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the word of God. Strength comes by hearing. Hearing of the prophetic word of God. The word of God will assure you of God's promises concerning you, of God's work concerning you, of God's armor for your defense. The word of God tells us that the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run it into it. And we are saved. This morning, I want you to remember these things. They walk in the life of a child of God, more than magic. They work so powerfully. As you go through the storm of life, as you, as you go through the vicissitude of life, as you go through the trials of your faith, remember these things, that you need the revelation of the word of God about his love towards you. You need to have that revelation that God loves me. You need to understand that the power of the one word in particular in his administration, the word of God has a power of administrating the, word, the grace of God in your life. You have to understand how to engage in strategic prayer. You have to maintain a lifestyle of joy. And you have to understand that every time you obtain grace, the prophetic word of God with you. Thank you for listening to me. I praise the Lord for you. I believe that as we go through life experiences, God has assured us he will never leave us nor forsake us. So he would deliver us from every situation of the world. Yet these and many other passages of the world assurance of the word of God into you, which then you can always punch the sword in the heart of Satan 
He doesn't want to hear it. And he knows many people don't know it. But for you, he will say, I won't waste my labor on this. I will leave him. I will go to another person. What caused our downfall in the Garden of Eden was the inability to understand the word of God. Apart from the fact that the woman jumped responsibility. God did not give the word to the woman. God gave it to the woman called Adam. Because the Bible tells us that he was there with her. He couldn't step in and say, no, 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 no. That's not what God says. God did not say we should not touch it. Exactly this is what the word of God says. Don't eat. He let the woman who wasn't there, who never had the instruction, to speak on his behalf. I don't know whether the man exaggerated it to her so that she would keep away from the three. But what she said is not what God said. And therefore, the devil can say, you will not, you will surely not die because you don't know the word of God. Today, God is so good to us. Every trials and every storm of your life shall be silent in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. What silent the storm in the ocean or the sea where Jesus Christ was, was the word of God. Be still. Bam. Coming from the Son of God. Coming from Florence, Formosa. Be still, you storm of my life. Coming from any one of us, be still. God has given me victory over you. I pray that as we go through life, and as long as the, the Lord God delays his coming, we will let the word of God, which is the assurance of victory, dwell richly in us. Father, we thank you for this morning. We we'll bless your name. We exalt you. We thank you, Lord God, that, Lord, you've come to remind us again of some basic few things that we need to exercise when we are in the storm of life. We thank you because you've guaranteed victory by your blood, even for every one of us. And reach your word that we've shared, oh Lord God. And as we go through your word, your scripture, for those passages that we just mentioned, Father, Lord, let your word build up in our heart so that when the enemy come against us like a storm, like a flood, that word will be risen up by the power of the Holy Spirit in us so that this storm of life will not drown us. Thank you, Lord God, for your assurance. Your word is dependable. Your word is reliable. Your word is trustworthy. In fact, oh Lord God, we know that you exalted your word far above your name, such that, Lord God, anyone that receives and abides in your word, abide in victory. Your word, oh Lord God, will cause us to have victory in every situation. Thank you for your people. Thank you for your church. Thank you because we are victorious people by the power of your Holy Spirit working in us. We give you thanks. We give you praise. I pray, oh Lord God, concerning any of my brethren hearing my voice, that Lord God, today, prove yourself mighty and wonderful in their lives for whatever situation they are going through. Give them the assurance of your word that is always yea and amen. They will come back, oh Lord God, to testify and tell us that I am the one who cried unto the Lord. The Lord heard me from his holy tabernacle and delivered me from all my fears. Come and taste. And the Lord is good. Thank you, Father. Blessed be your name. For in Jesus' precious mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen.